people, because I work out quite a bit and have for a very long time, and people ask me how they could, you know, help themselves do the how same. How do you get that body, and, Jeremy? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Season 2, Episode 39 of Bad Voltage. After a very short hiatus, I am back. Yes, you are. I'm sure I missed a, a rousing show that I will definitely listen to at some point in the future. <laughs> no, you won't. <laughs> you did. You did, actually. Popey was really cool. Thank you, Popey, for being on the previous show and standing in Jeremy's shoes. Thanks. He was interesting and taller. Um, <laughs> but that's beside the point. <laughs> So, um, what are we going to talk about on this show, Mr. L? Well, um, one of the larger pieces of news to hit the open source community has been Linus's post to the Linux kernel mailing list saying that he needs to reconsider his previous attitude and he's going away to get some help. And we're going to dive into that in some detail. Yes, we are. There's not much to discuss, is there? <laughs> <laughs> there is quite a bit. And uh, and we're also going to do a uh, quite a bit of news. We're actually going to do fewer bits of news, but we're going to delve into them in a little bit more detail. So yes. uh, we've got lots of good stuff. We're going to talk about um, Apple. Um, so if you don't like listening to Apple, you should probably switch off right now. Um, we're going to talk about <laughs> Google, the Peloton, um, all kinds of stuff. So Elon, stay Elon tuned. Musk. <laughs> Elon Musk. Yes. Stay tuned. All kinds of stuff. And now, Bad Voltage. <laughs> you know what it's time for. One day, we're, you know, don't you? we're going to be able to do the news segment without one of your stupid introductions. But apparently today is I, not but that day. I don't think that's ever going to happen. It's not today, it's but, not soon, it's probably but not But saying ever. that... Do you know what it's time for? <laughs> I do. It is time for the news. Do some news, John it O'Bacon. Is. Shall I start off? Yes. Uh, well, um, let's start off with the uh, with with Apple. Uh, Apple had their um, big hang on, hang on, hang on. announcement before, of it. Be, be, before you do that, um, someone explicitly asked us, please warn them if we're going to talk about Apple so they can stop listening for that bit. <laughs> <laughs> Which okay. I thought was that. a bit weird, but uh, okay, so we're going to talk a little tiny bit about Apple, and then we're going to talk about things that aren't Apple, so don't worry. Actually, actually no, uh, for that person, uh, much as the show notes have probably been incorrectly written, we're actually going to talk about Apple for the entire rest of the show. <laughs> So you should probably switch it off and go and listen to another podcast. <laughs> now, that's not kind, is it? Go on, then. Talk about the Apple 4. Just, Apple just kidding. Watch just kidding. Four, I sorry. also really particularly don't care about Apple. No. But I thought this was actually quite interesting. So Apple came out with their, with their, their hardware event, um, you know, which is populated by a bunch of Apple fanboys and the Google Pixel 3 team sitting there frustrated with their arms folded. <laughs> and... <laughs> Um, you know that you know um, that Google I/O is just the same, but the other way around, right? Right. Yeah, I know those Google clips. They've let the world on fire. Um, anyway, oh, I forgot about that thing. Oh, was that I the know, camera yeah. thing? Yeah, the camera clip. Uh, thing, literally, yeah. the last time that crossed my mind was when we talked about it a week after I/O or whatever. Has anyone seen yeah, yeah. one like in the wild or anything? No, I don't think so. No, I think it's like the uh, I think it's like the CD-ROM for the uh, Atari Jaguar. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is, in fact, the Google Wave of hardware. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll get onto Google in a little bit later on. Yes, we will. But um, I, I always actually find uh, the the Apple events uh, kind of interesting to to watch because I do think that, particularly recently, some of the innovation in the hardware is pretty profound like they were talking about this chip that can do tri five trillion operations a second or whatever it was which is kind of interesting from a tech perspective but what really struck my eye here was the apple watch 4 now this is another bloody smart watch whatever don't particularly care about that but what i thought was interesting here was they added these health additions so it includes an ecg which apparently has been um approved by the american heart foundation or something 
uh, which can actually detect abnormal heart rhythms um, and could potentially actually alert somebody to a serious heart issue. There is a an SOS function, which um, uh, I think automatically, like in the event of a, I think in the event of a fall or something along those lines, it will basically automatically call the call an ambulance and it will, um, you know, inform them of where your location is and things such as that. So I think these these additions, I like it when you know when we talked about the the Google event, we talked about the uh, health and wellness stuff that's starting to go into Android. Mm. I like these kinds of things going into products that that actually have an impact on somebody's broader well-being. And uh, I, I just think that that cramming all that kind of stuff into a into an Apple Watch is pretty incredible, given that you know what they're. I mean, it's such a tiny bit of hardware. So yeah, I, I just thought I'd share that. Thought it was quite interesting. Mm. And of course, the Google smartwatch ecosystem will deliver this stuff in the next two years. But, uh, you know, we're obviously heading in that direction. So You don't want to talk about the Alexa-enabled microwave, too? <laughs> oh, the 15 Amazon products? <laughs> yeah. God. And Amazon, come on. That, yeah, anyway. Yeah, and to be clear, I like the Amazon Alexa ecosystem and... Ramming, uh, ramming it into everything is annoying. I think I don't see an Alexa-enabled clock back there anywhere. <laughs> I, I, I do have that. I could just ask her for the time, and she'll tell me what it is, which I'm not going to do because she'll hear me as ever. <laughs> yeah, I mean, did you see that clip? I posted a clip to you guys. Uh, there's like a YouTube parody of uh, someone. It's uh, Alexis Jones. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Alexa Jones, <laughs> and it's basically you know Alex Jones as your Alexa assistant. Oh <laughs> like, no, that would be go and watch it. It's brilliant. The worst. <laughs> I will have a look at that. I, I, I will say um, briefly on the Apple thing. I'm I, I'm currently Android on my phone, but I know uh, oh, really a few people who are who have got um, uh, iOS phones and they've got the new iOS 12 version, and. There's been a pretty high level of impressiveness with it from people oh. I know. Now, the, the the new phone releases, as far as I can tell, whatever, right? There hasn't been anything cool to happen in phones in ages, and this is just more of the same. But the software, iOS 12 specifically, seems to be quite an improvement in a whole bunch of things. Things like Siri shortcuts seem very cool. People are sort of generally more happy and more impressed with this in a way that I haven't seen people who are iOS users be for the last two or three iOS releases. So hmm. is, is is Siri any good? It's it's Because it, er, Eric and I did a test. She's got an iPhone, and we were comparing Siri and... Google Assistant and Google Assistant won yeah. almost every test. Um, Siri has been up until very recently criminally underused and underfunded and under-resourced by Apple. But they appear to have realized that having been early into this game does not mean you get to keep the advantage because a lot of people think Siri's quite rubbish. And yeah. uh, and now we're seeing Amazon and Google get out way ahead of the game. So they're starting to divert, to divert resources back more towards it. Um, so we're yeah. likely to see it catch up quite quickly um, over the next year or two, I would say. Interesting. Good. More, the, more voice assistance for everybody. The, this is all good. Next piece of news. The only thing that... The, oh, no, well, on. the one thing, just to finish off on that, the, the, the only takeaway that I took away... <laughs> uh, from, from <laughs> what that, else do you do with takeaways? That's hard hitting news it is. <laughs> what a remarkable piece of journalism that was. <laughs> was uh, I smell a Peabody. Right. Was, um, you know, from watching the Apple event, I mean, they are just absolutely killing it on hardware. I mean, they're, they're, their hardware is so impressive, I think. Um, you know, the iPhone X and, and, the, and the Apple Watch and, and their laptops have always, I think, been very, very good. Mm -hmm. But speaking personally, I just think the software is what lets it down. Like, right. I was, when, I was watching, when I was watching the Apple Watch thing and I was looking at the, the new iPhone Max or whatever, XS or whatever it's called... Um, I genuinely, for the, fir for the first time in, I think, basically ever, thought maybe I should think about switching over to the uh, to the Apple ecosystem. And then I went and did some digging and watched, look at some of the software and all the rest of it. And I just thought, no way, Jose. I mean, it's just, I just did feel like the see... software is way better in the Google world. Uh, did you see the guy who submitted um, uh, 
uh, an update to his iOS app, which mentioned the new phones, and it got banned. No, no. <laughs> I mean, it, uh, he um. So Apple did the big announcement where they said, you know, the iPhone X R and the other one um are coming out, and so he updated his app to so it would support them. Basically, screen sizes or something. I think he didn't change anything about how the app worked. He just made sure that it would work on that phone. And so he he submitted a new version of the app with a change log entry. You know, the the, the what's changing this version thing, saying now supports the iPhone XR. And Apple rejected it and said, um, uh, this update mentions uh, unreleased uh, Apple devices. And he responded, going, okay, the phone's not out yet, but. The front page of Apple.com has a great big picture of it and its name, right? So this must just be a mistake, <laughs> submitted it again, and they went, no, nah, it mentions um, unreleased Apple devices and that's not allowed. <laughs> and so he then changed the release notes to say, uh, new version of the app also supports a brand new Apple device which I'm not allowed to mention because that's in violation of this entry in the Apple release standards. <laughs> and they were like, ha, oh, very funny, rejected again. <laughs> and, and it's like, really? This, uh, you know, I mean, the, the, normally, the, you, he, you heard all these stories about how the, um, the iPhone app review process was incredibly mercurial and awful and so on, but that was years Capricious ago. Precious in nature. Yeah, yeah, but they seem much less capricious these days than they did before. And I've certainly never had problems with putting right. apps on iOS. But maybe it just depends well, on well, which reviewer you get or something. But yeah, the, um, the rules are a little weird too. So obviously, I run a site called LinuxQuestions.org. It has a very mediocre at best Android and iPhone app. I also run a site called AndroidQuestions.org. They rejected the app because Android is in the name. Yeah, really. Yeah. Trademark infringement. No, they no, just don't, they just don't want Android. Acknowledge that there's another ecosystem of products that compete, I <laughs> yeah. guess. Oh, I, I, I mean, see. That... I love the fact that Linux Questions has a Mac and Android app. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> Where's your Ubuntu app there, Garcia? <laughs> if they the would have web... sold more than seven phones, I would have been happy to have a Ubuntu <laughs> phone. Boom. Oh, the bird. Oh, it... the spirit of, spirit of Lunduk's back. <laughs> yeah, no, um, Greg, Greg Knaus, the chap's name was. Um... Greg Canals. Yeah, K-N-A-U-S-S. -S -S, ah. And it was just comedy. <laughs> well, um, it, it, stay tuned, of course, because in a couple of weeks, uh, there's going to be the Google Pixel announcement. But given the fact that the Google Pixel uh, engineering uh, HQ seems to have turned into the Big Brother house with the number of leaks that we've had recently, there's not... <laughs> I don't think the there's fact that someone left one in the back of a lift is just the cherry on top of the most leaked product in the history of products. <laughs> Although there is a conspiracy that apparently this is just all a ruse and that they're actually going to announce something that's incredible at the event. I I'd, think that I'd like to think so because idea. I'd like to buy a new phone. I've had the Essential for almost a year, but... No, I don't think that's the case. Yeah. I don't think no. that's the case at all. But they, if that's not the case, if they announce the Pixel 3, Google need to do something about their security. Uh, clearances yeah. at that well I, I like, uh, we discussed in the in the last show you know i wonder if these leaks are deliberate i mean obviously in the last in, in the week since then it's become very apparent that they obviously just are but we got yes. brutally scored by jason evangelo <laughs> the, the guy's been writing the um the Lilith articles for forbes who was like, okay. dude, of course it's deliberate. For God's sake, why are you a child? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, sir. And we're like, yeah, uh, okay. Why are you a child? I would argue, why are you listening to Bad Voltage, if that's your question? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it was cool. It was, it, it, um, and it's good to hear from someone who's actually, you know, doing real journalism that it's just... Who's legit. It's, yeah, that it's just as obvious to them... <laughs> as it is to us. Occasionally you think, well, we can see this. Why can't anyone in the media see this rather than just credulously publishing the leaks? But, like, everyone knows. They just do it anyway. <laughs> Uh, so, so on, so we, on uh, this topic, I actually have two Google-related ones, so that ooh. was a, a smooth, smooth segue. Let's get Google. And I know Language had some of these as well. So the first one is, Google quietly started logging people into Chrome without their consent, and security experts say it's terrible for privacy. So just a, a little bit of background on yeah, this why one is that? For, for those who haven't seen it. It's obviously before you had the option of signing into Chrome or not. Starting, it looks like around Sunday, someone noticed that if you log into any Google service, be it uh, Gmail or any other suite of products, it will automatically then log you into the browser 
uh, without even really notifying you. You just have to kind of notice it. Uh, and it's I don't think they announced this really publicly anywhere. They have since acknowledged it. I, it seems like a terrible, terrible thing to do, given uh, privacy concerns no, and just the optics not, of it are, are pretty garbage. Yeah, not only do they quietly sign you into the browser, but if you notice and sign yourself out of the browser, signs you out of all the Google services as well. So it's not yes. ac- it's not actually possible without going in and tweaking a really obscure flag in the config. It's not possible to be signed into Google services without being signed into the browser. Now, the Google people are all, ah, but it doesn't do all the syncing and everything. You're just signed into the browser. It's just convenient. And you think, well, okay, but then why do What's it? What's the point? What's right. the point in doing it? And it does, it's hard to, I saw um, there was a chap, P. Frazzy, his name is on Twitter. I'm not sure what his actual name is. Let me just look it up. Is he a rapper? Pa- pa- <laughs> <laughs> his, na- his name is Paul Frazzy, right? <laughs> um, and he said that this is, in itself, this is a small thing, but there's this kind of worrying pattern of behavior from Google about, more integrating things which look like they're to Google's benefit and not to ours and so on, you know. Oh, so we're gonna we're gonna kill URLs and now we hide www dot or m dot or whatever and we're gonna auto integrate Google services and we do all the stuff with AMP and hiding away the real URL of the stuff and every one of these is a we'll do a thing and then maybe we'll undo it if we get too much pushback. And this right. sort of general so the- attitude of overreach is starting to be a bit worrying. And here's another one to add to the pile. As of Chrome 69, which was just just released, yeah. Google will keep all Google-related cookies even when you tell it to delete all cookies. Yep. Yeah. If if you go to if, what? You, if what? you go to the thing which says delete all cookies, you, you know if you go into yep. the settings, you want to clear all the cookies out. Um, it says next to it, um, "Don't worry, we'll not sign you out of Google services." And the way it doesn't do that is by not deleting the cookie. So it's it's not at all clear to me how, if you want to delete Google's cookies, you can. And to me, again, this is more of the overreach thing where we're going to protect you from all from people who aren't us doing terrible things with your data. It's like very generous of you, but what what if I want to be protected from you as well? I think I think what's happening here. This is a slightly more charitable view towards Google. Is uh, is I think that. You know, one of the things that I've noticed about Google recently is is the material um, UI uh, rollout is happening at an incredible rate across all of these different services. Right? It's hit it's hit Gmail, it's hit Calendar, yeah. it's hit in the mobile apps, it's hit in the text messaging, all kinds of different things. I think that they're really, really amping up their um, UI game for consumers. I think I don't think this some, is UI related. I think, I, I think that I think that this is a sea change that's happening where um, they're looking at things from a much more consumer perspective. Where, for example, consumers won't particularly care about so, um, deleting cookies, and if they do delete cookies, they will be annoyed if they get logged out of out of Google services because they don't understand how cookies work. I, I, they understand a, cookies to an extent. I took I think this as one of two things. I, I don't know that. I don't know that I'll agree with that. I took it as either, and I was curious. I was actually going to ask this question before you you went in that direction. Is what do you think this is? I think part of it to me seems like it could be uh, the beginning of a confirmation that engineers and, and product developers really are no longer in control at Google, and it's the marketing and biz dev side of things. And that's always, at least to me, a concerning pattern that usually doesn't end well. And I think being engineering and product first is really how Google won this game. And, and but it's very easy to forget when you're swimming in just piles of cash to, to remember how you got there. The the other option, and I still don't know what I think about this, given that this is a very new thing, is is it just Google being a ruthlessly, ruthlessly data-driven company and somewhere along the line said, you know what, this A-B testing showed that with this change, more people use Google services, and yes, it invades privacy a little bit, and sure, it'll piss off a couple, couple people on Reddit, but in the end, who cares? We're on a march to be the third trillion-dollar company, and this is going to get us there. I'm not uh, sure I, if it's A or B or a mix of A or B, or maybe it's what you said and it's consumer focused. But I, I, I think you actually both partially right. I, my opinion of this is one of the weaknesses that Google have always had, especially with Android, but in general across their stuff, is that it's all very, it's all very bitty. There's not a consistent feel up and down the stack. Things don't integrate well and so on. And part of that 
is because they've made everything swappable out. And so the links, everything has to be only loosely coupled. Whereas if you look at Apple, they control every aspect of the stack top to bottom. And that obviously, yeah. that obviously has downsides, number one of which is that you're the only person who can sell your phones, and therefore you've only got 25% of the market rather than 75%. But equally, it does allow them to deliver a much more consistent experience. Um, and I think Google want some of that. So they're prepared to stitch some layers of the stack closer together. So something like signing you into Google stuff. Um, why, if you're prepared to sign into Gmail, would you not be prepared to sign into the other stuff as well? That seems more convenient for everybody. Rather than, you know, a, a, an ordinary user says, um, I don't understand. Why isn't Google syncing my my history when it is syncing yours? And the answer is you're not signed in to Google. You go, but I am. Look, I'm signed into Gmail. And if you say, oh, no, but that's Gmail. That's not Google. Syncing. But why are they different? That's stupid. And, right, and, the, exactly. and they have a point. So um, the thing that I find disappointing is that, yes, I grant you, people mostly don't care about privacy and don't understand why it's important or why it should take precedence over things being easy to use. But the job there is not to go, okay, then. The job there is to help them understand and preserve their privacy and make it easy to use at the same time rather than just giving up. And it feels a little I, bit I, like we've, um, th those of us who think this sort of thing is important have a little bit lost a bit of an ally in that fight as Google may have either by, uh, by the, by uh, dint of their design team or by dint of their ruthless data driven analysis have decided this is probably less important than, providing a consistent, great user experience and maybe getting more people on board might uh, might be problematic for these trivial things of privacy. But overall, if more people are part of the Google ecosystem and they are part of everything that we, Google, are doing, then we can protect their privacy much better than otherwise, than they would be able to if they are confused the whole time. Right. And that's... Uh, I have no doubt that they're... In I have no doubt that they're incredibly data driven in 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 their decisions. I don't I don't necessarily I don't agree with Jeremy that their marketing people have taken over. I do think that Google will always be a product and engineering driven organization. But I think what's happening is their data is probably telling them things that would surprise us. And uh I, I just think that that I, where I think they're in an interesting position is your point Ack, about a consistent end-to-end -end experience. I think that they, Google, are trying to get towards that, and that's their pixel strategy, um, is the way they produce the hardware. You get this pure Android experience. But they've got a branding issue because, you know, you go out and buy a Samsung phone, it's completely different to a, to a pixel phone. Yes. And, and there's all kinds of crap that's bundled in there. That you, so you have to know a lot about the technology, whereas if you're, if you're an Apple customer, you just go and buy the Apple product, and it basically works. Yes. So I think they're they're they I think they're they're, tr they're transitioning more to an Apple model, and consequently, what you get from that is you get less flexibility and some compromises. So yeah, yeah. I mean, who knows? But it, it, who knows? It's it's interesting that Apple are actually doing a better job of the privacy stuff than Google are by miles they because are. Apple they Apple are, yeah. are not dependent on monetizing your data because, as I've said before, they've already monetized your money. So that's fine, right? They don't need to collect data on you, and therefore they can make a really strong play and say a load of stuff stays on the phone. It stays in the secure enclave. It's never synced to our servers. Whereas Google's business model is at least partially reliant on them having access to all your data. So yeah. anything they say about protecting your data and privacy has to be somewhat poo-handed. Because on the one hand, they can say, we protect your data, but it's like, we don't protect it from us because we need it. We just protect it from everybody else because they're all bad guys. It insists that Google lives inside your your trust boundary. right? Whereas Apple, right. at least in theory, don't do that. So, yeah, yeah. on on that front, Apple are doing quite a lot. Basically, look at the differential privacy stuff. I've literally do a talk about this. I don't want to do the talk. Um, but right. but yeah. I, th I think that's, that's really interesting, that Apple really can make a we are the device play, not the device is just a terminal into the cloud services. Yes. Anyway, next thing. What's next? Next up. Langridge, do you want to um, spit something out? I, I saw 
an interesting tweet, <laughs> um, which is from a guy saying Elon Musk is in the early stages of McAfee syndrome, <laughs> right? Which that's a strong, that's a strong, strong it, statement. It, it, it is a strong <laughs> statement, and there may be some people unaware of John McAfee and just how far from the pack oh. he has strayed in the last number of years. I mean, Go and watch the documentary about him if well, you want an introduction. I, to there may be a whole bunch of people who don't even know who McAfee is, right? Think about it. When did you last use antivirus software? Or think about it particularly hard. Um, like 30 well, years yeah, ago. So, so, um, so McAfee were Stop. a big software house back in the ni- 80s and 90s. And, and one of the big things they did was antivirus software. They were run by a bloke called John McAfee. But since then... You know, he left or whatever. And he's been very weird, right? But if but yeah. if you look at Musk, um, he increasingly seems to be a bit... Uh, he, I, I, he may only be in the early stages of McAfee syndrome. But he doubled down on calling that cave diver guy a paedophile. Um, yep. Smoked a joint on a podcast and the shares dropped 10%. <laughs> They're nine point two million dollars in debt. It's it, it surprises me how much the public perception of Musk has changed in the last only eighteen months, couple of years, Not from even, being yeah. from being the amazing tech visionary who's going to save us and lead us all into the light, possibly on Mars, to being a kind of mad rich guy who has a go at people on Twitter. <laughs> It's the paedophile thing to me that is when a lot of this started yeah. really happening. The the him smoking. I mean, I've watched pretty much the entire Joe Rogan. I, I love Joe Rogan, and I've watched. I, I love his podcast, and I love all the different people he gets on there because they come from all all sides, all angles. And Joe Rogan's a really great conversationalist. Um, so it was going to be a treat watching him talking to Elon. And uh, he smoked weed for like a minute and a half yeah. on that, on that two-hour thing. This is the story. Who is a big, cares? And, That's fucking ridiculous. And who cares? The anyway? fact that anyone cares about that is there was this whole thing about him smoking. Whatever. Come on. What are we living in the fifties? Well, I think part of the problem um, is that we're not living in the fifties, but a lot of the people who buy shares are. And I don't know. Is that, maybe is that the sort of thing you're supposed to care about as a CEO? Or are you supposed to go? No, I'm going to do the right thing in my well, opinion, regardless of worried, what the market thinks. And I if you're worried think about, that's fine, but then I'm not trading in shares. So. Yeah, and if you're buying shares and worried about the CEO, uh, uh, you know, consuming some form of illicit drug, I would suggest you buy no shares. <laughs> because I'm guessing that the vast majority of CEOs <laughs> are shoving something into their nose <laughs> or into their lungs. I'm, um, I'm, be- I'm um, bent by that argument, yeah. It's just... I, 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 I'm, and. and I think I do, I just think it's interesting that when I hear stories about Musk now, the the stories tend to be where he's done something odd or weird or where the negatives. I mean, this may just be because the press are eager to find a guy they put on a pedestal and then tear him down like the pack of ravening wolves that they are. But I think a lot. I think that's a lot of it. Also, his 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 personality is is become very erratic recently. Yeah. And I think, like, when you watch him on the on the uh, on the Joe Rogan podcast, his personality is way more erratic than it used to be. Mm. And I think some of that is, you know, is that he's he's basically he's got unfettered opportunity in front of him, right? Yeah. And he's a big futurist visionary kind of guy, and a lot of those people tend to get weird. <laughs> you know? If you're a futurist and have all of the money in the world. Then you have a large degree of possibility you are, for being. You weird. are somewhat untethered <laughs> from reality. Yeah, I mean, but this ties into <laughs> yeah. stuff we talked about in the last show when Popey was on. We talked about um, where if you've got a Tesla and basically anyone who's not an authorized Tesla engineer stands within five miles of it, they'll never fix it for you ever again, <laughs> right? Right. And that kind of thing—it's all playing into an overall narrative of Musk is losing it. And I don't know whether he, right. he is or not, but certainly that's much more the narrative I'm hearing rather than um, humanity will stream into the stars as pure data led by Elon Musk, which is what we were getting two years I ago. A, I have a theory about this, and it's a sad theory. Speak theory. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't want to be a downer, but I'm going to be a downer. I think he is suffering from um, a very, very, very serious um, bout of depression. 
and I think he's not a happy guy. And I think he's finding it increasingly difficult to find satisfaction in the work that he's doing. So, um, you know, I think he's like, he says on the, on the, on the Joe Rogan thing, I've seen him say this before, you know, he's fundamentally is a nerd, right? He does a lot of engineering and software development type stuff. Um, I don't think he particularly enjoys running businesses. Um, and I think he's, I think, you know, when, when, when your life is exciting all of the time, right, even exciting stuff can become rote and, yeah. and mundane. And I, I worry that I think he's, he's again, like we have emphasized, uh, in the future, <laughs> people in positions of, of, uh, of, of influence are people too. And, and they can go through, they can suffer from depression. They can suffer from anxiety and other things like that. And I think that he's sadly going through that right now and he's doing it on the public stage. A lot of Which people who tough. go through that, they, they do it privately. Uh, yeah. So. yeah. And that, and that's tough. No, that's, that's a fair comment. Actually. I can see that. So, okay. So should we pass on from that um, to a different piece of news? Yes. Do you want to go, Jeremy, or do you want me to do something? Go ahead. Um, I have a little personal thing to share. It's uh, like a mini review. I bu- yeah. We bought a Peloton bike. Have you heard of these things? This is the thing where you put your real bike on it, and then it's, and then it becomes an exercise bike. No. No. Oh, what are they called? I thought so that's what a Peloton, Peloton bike. <laughs> a Peloton bike is basically an exercise bike with a 22-inch um, Android tablet glued on the front. And, oh, okay. Um, and what you what it's it, instrumented it by Datadog actually, is it really? Yeah. Huh. excellent! Nice. I did not know that. Is it um, so? So it, what, does it streams up the stuff to Datadog, or is it on the device itself? The, well, I'll let him get into the review. We can oh, talk. Okay. <laughs> so, so in a, in a, before we get into the fucking Datadog, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just doing my bit to show Jez's company. Right, it seems reasonable. <laughs> Jesus. You know, when he joined Datadog, we said he's going to sell out to the man immediately. Yeah, it took longer than we expected, but it's happened. <laughs> Turns out um, it didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, basically, the Peloton is, um, what happens is they they stream live classes to it. So, they'll, they'll, they've got a studio in New York, and you'll have this instructor who will be on a Peloton, and there's a little dial on it that will increase the resistance. And on the screen... You've got one number, which is cadence, which is how fast you're pedaling, one number, which is your resistance, and then one, which is output, which is a combination of the two. And then basically you have these classes and they'll, you know, they'll basically tell you to go to a particular level of resistance and cadence. And, you know, you'll be on a flat road and then you'll go up a road. And of course, it tracks all of the metrics for what you're doing. It tracks your heart rate. There's a heart rate strap that you put onto it. And and it's got a leaderboard while you're doing one of these classes. Eric and I walked past one of these stores and wandered in. She'd heard of it, of course. I'd never heard of it. And I went and had a go on one. And when you're doing one of these classes and there's a leaderboard and you can see yourself going up the leaderboard, it's bizarre how it conjures up some competitive spirit in you. So we, Eric had a go on one. I had a go on one. And we got it. And I thought, I'll probably do it once a week. I work out usually three or four days a week. Um, I'll probably do it once. I don't foresee me getting into it. I'm now doing it pretty much every other day <laughs> oh, wow. during the week. And it's it's very, very cool. And the one thing I would say is it's not cheap, right? It's a couple of grand for the bike. And, and then monthly. Pay. And then you've got the $35, I think it is, monthly fee yeah. for the for the for the classes. And there's loads of on demand classes as well if you, if you can't. Oh, right. So you don't really have to buy you ones. don't have to buy the classes. You can just use it and track yourself. No, you well, can you lose all of the competitive stuff that he was talking about. You lose all of that if yeah. you don't pay the monthly. Oh, yeah, right. so you don't get the on-demand stuff if you don't pay the monthly stuff as well. Um, but um, the thing that's blown me away is I've never in my life seen a consumer product that is so well designed and delivered as the Peloton, from the bike itself to the software to um, uh, you know signing up for your account to the integration of the metrics into your account to how it syncs with Fitbit to... Yep how they run their blog and how they run their YouTube. It is, it is one of the most perfectly executed companies I've ever seen. And apparently they're growing like gangbusters. Yeah. They are. They're, they're bringing out some treadmill, which sounds awful to me. <laughs> um, so, uh, but yeah, anyway, mini review, uh, go and check out the Peloton. It's quite cool. Nice. Uh, have you tried one of these, Jezo? 
Yeah, so we, there was actually one in the Datadog booth at reInvent. Uh, it's, it's, it is, oh, more Datadog it, facts. Fascinating it is, facts. It is genuinely a pretty cool uh, device. And the amount of technology in it, it's a really neat platform behind the scenes. So it's uh, from a technology, it's an interesting nexus between technology and more traditional workouts. It's, I think it's a really cool device. The, the price point is a little bit much, but the people that have them, it's almost like a cult. They really, really, really like them. And the one thing that I've heard about them pretty consistently, and this is a lot different than a lot of other exercise equipment, is a year later, people still use them. Right. Ah, yeah. I was going to ask about that, whether it's kind of a, you know, a January thing. <laughs> no, so right. a, a lot of exercise equipment obviously is. And I think the one thing that I've always told people, because I work out quite a bit and have for a very long time, and people ask me, how they could, you know, help themselves do the how same. How do you get that body, and, Jeremy? Yeah, I mean, no, as, <laughs> as, as out of shape as I am now, I still work out a fair amount. And the thing that I've always said is you need to find something that's a lifestyle change. If you look at it as I'm going to work out this or I'm going to do this, as soon as you, let's, let's say you want to lose X amount of pounds, as soon as you lose X amount of pounds, you're probably going to lose motivation. Where if you look at it as I want to do this continually because I need a lifestyle change, those tend to be the things that you do over years because I, I didn't yep. work out for much of my life and it's something that I started much later, but now have sustained it probably for at least a decade, if not more. And it's really, really when did you start, when did you start exercising? Probably about 10 years, like in your t- about 10 years ago, probably really? uh, after so very like much when you, not. Like when, and, and I eat a lot. So when and, you were like 50, six, okay. 60, 65, I figured <laughs> as soon as I retired, I should start working out more and, and I've done so. But no, the, I think that really is how you have to view it because once you're in just the mentality of, like Jono, you said, I work out three times a week. It's just a thing that you do. It's not, you, right. it would be weird not to do it. Once you're in that, it's habit, once, yeah. it, once it's a habit, it, I think it's a lot more sustainable. And it yeah. seems like the Peloton and these, I don't know if it's the paying the $35 a month is actually a hook to get you into it as much as right. they obviously want a business model. But I think if you're paying for something, you're going to be like, ah, I don't really feel like it, but I'm not going to waste the money might right. be a component of why they are. And I think the, from what I've heard, the classes are super engaging and it's super competitive and uh, that it almost makes you feel like you're in New York city at the class. Cause you can actually take the class in New York. Live. You can. Right. Yeah. Uh, but it, I, I, it's, the, the, it's almost an immersive experience. It, it, you know, the one thing I was curious about was if you're doing one of these classes, whether you're going to get distracted and cause you know, when I've exercised Typically, I'll either play the drums or I will get an elliptical trainer and watch Netflix. And when you're watching Netflix or you're playing the drums, you're basically mentally engaged in like really interesting stuff, right? Because it's <laughs> music and movies, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, "Am I going to be? Am I going to be engaged by someone called Chad bouncing up and down <laughs> on a freaking bike?" And uh, and uh, it is bizarrely engaging. And one of the things that surprised me more than anything is. They have this, like, uh, this is going to, Ak, you're going to vomit when you hear me say this. I'm sorry. But when they, um, when they, when they uh, do these classes, they basically, they, they basically tell you, like, stop being lazy. Like, they, they give this sense of you can freaking do it kind of thing. And it's bizarre how, how um, intoxicating that is. And that's developed this kind of cultish thing. So, yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Excellent. We've done a lot of we news. We have done a lot of news, should yes. We, we should, we we should probably done. think about maybe wrapping up and saving some of this other news for later on. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, More news. Um, Future news. Let's do it. Enough news. So, interesting Linus Torvalds news, don't we think? <laughs> <laughs> it's been a heck of a few weeks, hasn't well, it? Well, I mean, I can't believe there are that many people who listen to this show who haven't come across this. But to briefly summarise, Linus Torvalds uh, wrote a post to the Colonel mailing list, uh, which, and he said it that this is where the look, it, look yourself in the mirror moment comes in. Basically, he's saying um, he he came to the somewhat painful personal admission that he needed to change some of his behaviour and he wanted to apologise to the people that his personal behaviour hurt and that he'd possibly driven away from kernel development entirely. And he's taking some time off and getting some assistance, he says, on how to understand people's emotions and how to respond appropriately. So this was obviously dropped as a as a huge bomb into the open source discourse. 
I like that it was just a release note on an RC release of a kernel. Uh, well, yeah, I, think, <laughs> I, I can imagine no more Linus Torvalds and Linux in general thing than to put this incredibly important personal admission in as part of the release notes for 4.19 beta 3 or whatever it was. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what did you chaps think about this? So I th- there's a lot to unpack here, and I suspect we all have opinions. The, the thing that's no. interesting to me, I think, well, there are a couple things that are interesting to me, I think. They're, one, Linus is a stubborn, persistent, uh, unyielding, I, I think, especially when he senses something is either politically motivated or is, in his mind, bullshit for whatever definition of that you want to give for him. And I, right. I, I genuinely believe that these are all really valuable qualities for the head of a massive, massive, almost unparalleled software open source project. Uh, and I, I genuinely believe part of that mentality has to do with some of the success that the kernel has been able to not only achieve, but maintain. However, I think there's times that Linus has been a little bit of an asshole. And I think that it's the, when he was turning technical criticisms into something a little bit more personal, I think is especially when he crossed that line. And to me, it's important to never make it personal. You can say this code yes. isn't getting accepted because, and be very frank about the because, but the shut the fuck up to use a specific example that keeps getting touted. But there's a couple of times where I really think he made it personal and I don't think that's ever needed or it really is constructive or beneficial in any way, shape or form. So I, the, one thing that I'm impressed with Linus here is to be so honest with yourself so publicly in front of so many people is something not a lot of people can do and is really not an easy, easy thing to do. So yeah. I, I'm impressed with his kind of self-awareness here. I, I genuinely hope that he improves because I really think we need him. I know, you know, Guido's recently stepped down and it's inevitable that he will someday step down, but I, I really think he has had a lot to do with the success of Linux it's not just in solving the technical problems because those are a little easier to solve than I think people think sometimes it's the personal problems that are really difficult. And I, I, he needs to be able to keep the technical correctness in a way that doesn't alienate some contributors, I think. And it's a fine line at times. Um, So it's going to be interesting to see how he progresses. And I think it's important that we all support him in that progression. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I, I wrote a blog post um, shortly after this kind of went down, uh, about this. And one of the things that really struck me from his, his post to LKML was <clears throat> when he said that he, he has realized that he struggles in kind of the emotional side of human interaction. And, um, you know, all three of us have worked with kind of personalities, strong personalities or people in kind of in, like very influential positions. And I think very few people tend to exist in positions as high profile as he does, certainly in the tech world. Um, and to come to that realization so publicly and so personally, I think is difficult. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I was kind of, my blog post was basically saying, you know, I think we do need to support him. I don't think there's a benefit to dredging up the past, but there is a caveat here. And the caveat here is that he should, we should see results, right? Yeah. I mean, I don't think Linus is the kind of guy who will say something and then not follow through on it. Um, so I, I'm confident that there will be results, but, you know, he doesn't get a whole pass for this. But I'm, I'm just kind of the human side of it to me. I'm, I'm mindful of the fact that, look, I, I don't know him particularly well. And I see him from time to time at conferences. And I think overall is a nice guy. But his, his, his kind of in-personal personality is really quite different to his online personality, which is pretty common in open source. And um, what I care about most is, is, that the, is that we get to the end goal, which is you know, uh, a, a Linux kernel project that doesn't have that kind of personal attacking that is more open and more welcoming to, 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 to new members. The thing that blew me away was, so the contributor covenant that's being put up there, there's been some bickering in some parts of the, uh, of the Linux community about this. And it seems entirely reasonable to me, you know, like <laughs> yes. the, the, um, I don't, it's just basically don't be an asshole, uh, written down. And, and I mean, it's obviously more than that. I'm being flippant, but yeah. it seems a very reasonable step forward. And the, the one thing that I missed out, one final point I want to make here is the one thing that I missed out on my blog post, which I should have put in there is, you know, we should be appreciative to, to some of those folks who have raised this as an issue, right? In, in 
getting this resolved. Like, people don't solve problems by staying quiet, but also we have to be constructive in how we solve these kinds of problems. And I think there's probably a lot of people behind the scenes. We always see about the public kind of blowouts and this kind of thing, but I get the impression there's been a lot of people behind the scenes who have probably been playing a role in helping to kind of get to where we've got to, which ultimately is going to be a better direction in my mind for the Linux kernel. So, right. Yeah. I mean, if, um, to, to carry on with your point about Linux himself and coming to the realization, I... I was, uh, like the two of you, genuinely surprised at how honest the post was. Now, I mean, he says um, right. uh, the fact that I misread people and don't realise for years how badly I've judged the situation and contributed to an unprofessional environment is not good. And yep. that two uses of the word professional in there, there's one of them saying I've been contributing to an unprofessional environment and the second one saying I'm going to go and get professional help. And yes. that's fantastic. You know, he's um, he's not just saying, oh, yeah, I'll try and do better. I mean, and we do need to see results, right? I would I would not like it if this happens, then ev- nothing actually changes. But it does sound yeah. like he, he genuinely has achieved a realisation. He wants this to get better. The, the thing I do not understand is you've got, there's a whole bunch of, unfair shit being things like um so his daughter patricia who i didn't know existed until this blew up um uh what an arsehole is is a (laughs) signal well you know sorry call me mr uninteresting the life of the person who runs the colonel um (laughs) yeah so his daughter patricia is signatory to a thing called postmeritocracy.org and is a self-declared feminist and there's some people are accusing linus of being somehow influenced by his daughter like that's a bad thing i mean i listen to my daughter all the time i, I listen to my son and he's freaking five and a half yeah i i, I, I don't understand <laughs> why getting input to from a parent. diversified set of inputs and then changing how you think how how dare you guys be rational what well, a monster that's, 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 <laughs> this this is exactly uh, this is why i didn't understand it i didn't understand the the virulence that this accusation has behind it like she's come in and ruined linux the linux kernel for all of us i'm like no linux has has looked at what he's been doing for years and what people have been saying about what he's been doing for years and fine if it took someone close to him to put it to him in such a way that he listened rather than reflexively pushing back then well done to her, really. I mean, I freely admit that I'm more likely to listen to criticism from my friends and people I trust than I am from the peanut gallery on the internet. And yeah, finally, I mean, should. maybe that makes me a bad person, but I, no, I, if, if, even if it does, I'm not worried about being in the dock for it on account of the 7 billion other people who'll be in there with me. Right? <laughs> I mean, one thing, and it's obviously I, I, on all three of our parts is going to be conjecture, but I am a little bit curious given A, how he worded the email, and B, as you mentioned, how long that he's been receiving feedback like this, what the genesis for the change was, right? I think there's right. a component of it that's probably that he wanted to miss Kernel Summit for the first time or Maintainership Summit. I think part of it is there was a New, New Yorker had uh, asked him a couple of questions. But in a vacuum, none of those seemed big enough to take feedback. That has been pretty consistent over a pretty long amount of time, both, and all of a sudden listen to it. So I, I genuinely am curious what the genesis of this was, or maybe it was just the right time and the the right combination of multiple of those things. But it, it may be that the, I would like to believe that the New York article is the straw that broke the camel's back rather than the impetus for all of this, because right. it would massively devalue this personal realization that he's come to after some agonizing if it was actually just motivated by the fact that a critical news article was going to come out somewhere outside the tech press and so he wanted to get out ahead of it i hope that's not the case i don't think he cares about that stuff at least seemingly he hasn't in in the past i i I suspect it's like with everything it's a bit of both i suspect that the new yorker was probably an impetus but the, the train was probably already rolling in the right direction, is my guess. I don't know. Um, because this feedback has been communicated repeatedly. I think part of the problem here, like uh, your point about the peanut gallery, I think that with some people, they see some of this kind of like social justice stuff that's been happening, not just in tech, but across everywhere, right? And I think that they 
often infer a risk that isn't really there, right? Yeah. So I think there are I think there are some people who will be of the view that oh, if we let these SJWs get their you get their grubby hands on the Linux kernel, then it's going to be harder for men to be able to submit pull requests, that we will have to lower the quality of the Linux kernel so women and underrepresented groups can kind of participate. And I think that's a, in my mind, a pretty uninformed view. I think there are definitely some people on the kind of the social justice side of the world who are a lot more hardcore than others. And I think there has to be a line somewhere where you can make sure that equality is genuine equality towards everybody. But I don't think that that's what's been advocated for in the Linux kernel. I think that all that's been advocated for is Linux behaving like a responsible leader and and not personalizing issues and continuing to treat things, to treat pull requests or whatever on the merit of the code, but just don't be a dick about how you handle that situation. But I think some of these people who are fearful of some broader patterns that they may be seeing and probably just consume a lot of media that is critical towards SJWs yeah. are reading too much into something that isn't really happening. Now, that's not to say there aren't... I do think there are elements from time to time where the social justice um, advocates sometimes do push it a little d- a bit too far. But but the pendulum's got to swing too far in one direction for you to be able to get the right in balance. That's just how fixed. society tends to work. Yeah, that's yeah. I mean, th- to, to give you a, an example of that, one of the things that I've seen bandied about mm-hmm. a lot is that the author of the Contributor Covenant, Covenant who is... Um, I'm not sure I'm going to pronounce her name correctly. I don't know her. Uh, Coraline Ada Emka. It might be. I don't know. I, I think, not, it's, I'm I think sure. it's Emka. Emka. I'm not sure how her surname is pronounced. Um, she's explicitly declared it to be a political document. It takes a political stance. And people are saying that this is a terrible thing and we don't want politics in our Linux kernel. And I sort of think, well, if it was some other community, maybe, but you're part of the free software community. How can you possibly not think that what you're doing is politics, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, free software as a whole is an explicitly political stance, and it's an explicitly political stance that most people out there in the world don't agree with. Here's the thing as well is... <clears throat> It's it's such a naive viewpoint because there's politics freaking everywhere. Yes. Whether you play in a band, whether you're part of an art collective, whether you're working a business, whether you run your own business, whether you're in a family, there's politics absolutely everywhere. It might not necessarily be, you know, liberal versus conservative government related politics, but there's politics everywhere. Yeah. So, so to ju- suggest that an environment is politics-free is just ridiculous. What, what that, as far as I can tell, what this environment is politics-free means is that this environment has politics, but they're in my favour, so I don't notice them. Right. <laughs> it's and, yeah. and that's the that's the daft thing, the thing I don't understand. I mean, y- y- um, you've got people saying, but look at these these new rules where people will be able to be drummed out of the Linux kernel contributor community because they say the wrong things. And, I mean, I, I personally don't believe that that's the case, but let's say it is, right? This is a theoretical problem for the future. You can point right now at people who have been drummed out of the Linux kernel contributor community for real by the way that it currently is by the culture that's currently operating in that community. But those people <clears throat> don't seem to be as important as some theoretical future people who might get drummed out. And I don't understand the the dichotomy right. there. It's it's hard to say we don't want this to happen because some people might be excluded from contributing in the future and say that that's worse than what we have now where people actually definitely have been excluded. <laughs> It's funny as well, the, um, <clears throat> well, it's not funny, it's not funny at all, but uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> this is not comedy. Uh, the one thing that in this, in this tale as well that um, I've found a little bit frustrating, and I, I accept the fact that I have a biased viewpoint in this, is some of the criticism towards the role that the Linux Foundation has played in this. So for those of you who are less familiar with Linux, um, uh, Linus is employed by by the Linux Foundation, who are a, who are a trade organization who have basically, you know, they run a ton of conferences. They have all of these foundations, uh, of which Linux is is one piece of the Linux Foundation's um, overall work. 
<clears throat> and there's been some people who've been pretty vocally critical of the Linux Foundation for um, not being able to effectively control Linux um, and to be able to affect these kinds of changes earlier. And when these kind of dust-ups have happened in the past, then the Linux Foundation have sometimes taken a beating over this. Now, part of the reason why I say I'm biased here in full disclosure is I have a, a reasonably close relationship with the Linux Foundation. I run uh, a track that's uh, that's part of the Open Source Summit, and um, I've, I know the people who run the Linux Foundation. I've known them for many years, and I consider some of them as friends. So, uh, But I, I think I'm objective in my view of this, and... In terms of this situation with the Linus, I, I think that their hands were reasonably tied. And and the reason for that is, is, you know, Linus works for the Linux Foundation. He's well compensated. Um, but if the Linux Foundation tried to force him to change his behavior back when he was behaving like this, um, there is absolutely no reason why he couldn't conceivably, as far as I'm aware, quit and go and work at Red Hat or go and work at Google. He is bigger than the Linux Foundation. And there's only so much you can do. It's kind of like, um, I think, um, you know, publishers or broadcasters who have celebrities who have personality quirks. There's only so much you can you can do to control those quirks. And then, you know, sometimes those people get fired, but they get fired for, for you know, essentially it's the straw that breaks the camel's back. Um, so I feel a little bit of sympathy towards the Linux Foundation because I just don't think there was a lot they could do. I think they could try and affect change. And I suspect that what's happened is that the LF have been working for years to try and move Linus in the right direction, helping him to realize, like, look, y you can't behave like this. Like, this is this is not the way in which we can grow Linux. But Linus is, is fully aware of, of, of the position he's in and fully aware of the control that he has. So that was the other element to this. I've seen a lot of people bagging on the LF. For this. There are various people who are critical at the L of the LF for various reasons, and I think that's a good conversation to have. But in this regard, I think it was... You know, I have a bit of sympathy towards them for that. I don't know if that makes sense to you guys or not. I'm, I, I'll be honest, I hadn't heard much in the way of Linux Foundation criticism about this. Um, I, I, it's, it's, it's possible just because I'm moving in different circles to you. You know, I mean, you're much more on the kind of right. enterprisey side of the world than I am anyway. Um, right. So me down at the grassroots nobody's talking about the Linux foundation <laughs> but yeah it, right. it, it, i i certainly think that what you're saying is is right if there is a bunch of criticism on this particular point i i don't think that criticism is particularly justified because what else could they have done i'm confident yeah. that they have been <clears throat> saying something at numerous times in the past and it just hasn't gone through i mean linus has not only been unreceptive to this sort of criticism in the past. He's been actively anti-receptive to it. It's not like he hasn't right. noticed it. He's noticed it and gone, right. but I don't care. The way I do things is better. And it isn't. And he's realised that. Right. You know, which yeah. is the, I mean, I, I, I do find it, Again, interesting is not the word. Disappointing, I suppose, that there are a lot of people out there who defended uh, Linus's approach to to argument and criticism and saying, "Well, you know, uh, uh, if you need to contribute to the, if you want to contribute to the Linux kernel, then you've got to run the gauntlet of Linux, and that's a good thing because it keeps the code quality high." and would defend using that approach in other projects as well, pointing at Linus as the flag bearer for it, and saying, it must work, it must be a good culture to instill in a technical project, because <clears throat> Linus does it, and the Linux kernel is successful, therefore it's a good idea. Now Linus himself has said, actually, I was wrong, I shouldn't have done that. I'm not right. seeing many people who were defending his approach for go, oh, okay, Linus is wrong, maybe I should also reconsider it. They go, no, Linus is wrong. I, a philosophy that I'm holding up Linus as a flag bearer for now doesn't have its flag bearer and I'm still defending the philosophy. Well, the other thing as well is that, uh, uh, I'm not sure if you guys will agree with me on this, but um, I think those people who hold the Linux kernel up as a, as like the, the example of an open source project that's a that's a poor example to set because li the Linux kernel operates unlike most other open source projects. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, in, in like how their engineering workflow works, 
the size of the project, the kind of people who are participating in it. It's a very unusual project. So even whether you're talking about Linus's behavior or not, to use that as an example of how to run an open source project, it's pretty unique, yeah. you know? Yeah. Most, most of them don't operate that way. So It, it, is, it um, is unique. I don't know of anything else that works like the Linux kernel. Um, big, right. Because it's, it's pretty old school. Yeah, it's, it, because know? it's big and it's old school and it's got a wide, shallow um, uh, contributor right. base. And there are so many separate parts in it where you can be a complete expert in one bit of it and know nothing about almost all the rest of it. And it's a world-class, world-leading project, which almost everything else isn't as well. So it's not like other things. And using it as a model is weird. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's. What, so, what do you think's next? Like, what do you no, think? Where do you think we're gonna go? Actually, my next question, because he's taken some time off, right, um, to to kind of focus on this, um, and I believe Greg KH is. Were we talking? Was it you guys, or was I was talking with someone recently before all this went down about who would run the Linux kernel yes. if? Did we talk about that on yes, the show? Yes, we did. We've definitely talked about <laughs> it previously. So. Yeah, and I, I I've always thought that it's Greg KH. Um, <laughs> he's Linus two point oh, um, but um, yeah, I mean, I think he's kind of taken over the reins. What do you think is going to happen? Do you think these changes will? Because this is a lot of change, right? The 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 the, the contributor covenant has gone in there. Mm -hmm. Linus is taking a step back. Do you think we're going to see this happen, Jeremy? I mean, given Linus's personality, I would imagine that we will see some demonstrable change t to the, d the extent to which that change will be. I, it's, humanity is difficult to uh, predict, I think. I, 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 yeah. I, I hope that it's what everyone wants, and I hope it's more, I think, just as importantly what he wants and that it's a smooth transition. Um, I think that whether that happens or not is difficult to predict. What do you think? I, I think... Uh, um... This is the first brick in the wall, and there are a bunch more bricks still to go. But I think the yep. very fact that this conversation has started has exhibited the number of people out there, which is, um, well, the, the small but loud group of people out there who are massively resistant to this kind of change without ever even seeing it. Um, yep. So let us coming back... And having achieved this realisation and attempting to improve things will, over time, change the culture of the kernel community, I think. Assuming it's not all a snow yeah. job, assuming he doesn't just come back and nothing's changed. <laughs> but I don't believe it's going to happen. Like, like the two of you, I think that he's at least a bloke who does tend to, when he sets his mind to something, at least achieves it in some measure. Um. So there's certainly one really good example of that. There's two really good examples <laughs> of that, right? Linux and Git. Well, yeah, exactly. So. Right? This, this, this is the bloke who's and some diving software. Yeah, well, whatever. Don't care, don't care <laughs> so. about the diving software, but yeah. So I think if he comes back and changes the uh, the culture, will start to change as a result of that. That's a that's a long term, multi year process, and it, and he's not and no one's gonna believe that he's really made this change for ages, which may be frustrating to him. If he comes back in a few weeks and he really genuinely has changed, then it's going to take a long time for people to actually believe that that's the case. But then, you know, go and talk to people yep. at Microsoft who are going through exactly the same problem. Um, right. But I, right. I do think it will change. What to me is going to be interesting. Have you seen this stuff about people saying that they're going to withdraw consent for their patches to the kernel? Yeah, they say, no. What's yeah, that? there's um some people are saying, well, now that the SJWs have taken over, I'm I'm taking my patches back out of the kernel. I'm revoking permission to use them, so you can't have them, and we should do that. Um, and they seem very much like you know what was the name of the thing that was Debian but without System D? Debian, oh, Deb De De Debian for a long time. <laughs> yeah, shut up. After System D <laughs> happened, I mean, <laughs> okay, De Dev Devuan or whatever. And there were some people were like, it, yes. System D has come in and he's destroying everything. And there were arguments of the same kind of 
the same kind of vitriol, the same kind of everything we love is being destroyed by this invading force. And yeah. a whole bunch of people said, well, we must fight against this and I will not allow System D onto any of my machines and we should fork Debian and make it. And some people, to their credit, actually did. They took Debian and they took all the System D stuff back out and they made a thing called DevUan. I think it was called DevUan. I'm not sure how you meant to pronounce it. Good grief. And it's Debian, but without System uh. D. And it's still being maintained. And presumably people who really feel strongly about this are still using it. And that's good. That's a really good example of how the open source world works. If you don't like the way something's going and the momentum is not with you... You can make a change. Then you can, you can fork, take it somewhere else and see if the momentum follows you. And I hope yes. this happens with this as well. I hope that the people who are complaining about this and saying, well, we must we must not use this new Linux because now it's been infected. They, I hope they go, they take a project. People say, well, we should fork the kernel. Go ahead. Take the kernel. You know fork what, it, And if, if your one's more popular, everyone will come with you and then you'll be proved to be right. And that seems like totally the thing they should do. I do not think they will succeed in the slightest. <laughs> but, you know, in, in, you in the same way that, in the same way that when the uh, the last election was going on in the US, there were so many people who would say, if Trump gets elected, I'm moving, oh, I'm to, moving Canada. to Canada. <laughs> and how many of these people have actually moved to Canada? Mm, not so sure. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. Um, you know, look, if you, if you disagree, the open source community allows the ability for people to have very productive disagreements. But those disagreements need to be productive, right? Yeah. Like, just whining about it doesn't get you yeah, anywhere. If, if, um, if you want to run something on what you believe is a meritocracy, if you think the Linux, um, the Linux kernel no longer is the kind of meritocracy that you want to run, then take the kernel, run a separate project, call it, um, you know, Live You Ad or something <laughs> <laughs> instead of Linux, and, <laughs> and, uh, and run that. And if everyone agrees with you, they'll come with you. That seems to me like nope. a perfectly reasonable approach. I don't think that's going to happen. I think what people will do is just continually grumble about it. But, you know, fine. Right. That's, that, that is the, their um, right as well, I suppose. <laughs> the, uh, the one thing that I just... I think we're kind of naturally coming to the end of this, but the, of this segment, not the end of this full topic. Uh, but the one thing that... I, and again, I touched, I don't want to shill my blog post, but the one thing I touched on in my blog post, but we touched on this at the beginning of this segment, is I think sometimes it's easy to forget that um, when you see, you know, people who are in these positions of power and positions of influence, that they are human beings and they have their own struggles, whether they're politicians, whether they're rock stars, whether they're artists, movie stars, or kernel developers. And in my mind, I think it's always important as a human being to be able to support people's um, growth and development in the right direction, right? Yep. So if somebody, for example, decides that they're, they're an alcoholic and they want to stop drinking, then it's implicit on their friends to be able to support their choice in, in doing so. And I think in a similar way, in this situation, I think there's a lot of, um, I think there's a lot of hurt feelings about what the way Linus has, has behaved over the years some observers and some who have been directly affected by some of that behavior. And I think it's, it's tempting to kind of reject any change in direction because, you know, it's too little too late kind of thing. But I do think it's important for us, whether it's him or whether it's anybody else for us to try and get behind and support that, uh, give him a shot. Um, and, and that's why I think, you know, assessing like what happens next is the important thing. If nothing happens and it just revokes back to the original situation, then I think people will have a right to be, um, you know, to be, to be critical. But I do think we need to give him a bit of a shot in the same way that, you know, when you find out these politicians make terrible mistakes and then they, they have some kind of, uh, you know, they're conciliatory in the fact that they've made these mistakes and they want to make some changes. We should judge them on it, but we should support them on it. So that's the only thing I hope is that, you know, I, I, when in these kinds of situations, I often think about like, you know, what's it like for him and his family? Um, what's it like to personally go through something like that? Yep. So, uh, I hope for everyone's sake that it's uh, that it's a good step forward. So, Agreed. yes. So fingers yeah. crossed. So fingers. Yeah. We should so sit back and see what happens next. I suppose. Bad Voltis will be reporting on the next steps. <laughs> <laughs> we probably shouldn't really report this. 